just as we lit the rose candle, the pink candle, for joy, so Paul in our reading wants to ignite joy in our hearts and in our lives. He writes, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. Rejoice always. That's actually a whole Bible verse. If you're looking for a Bible verse to memorize, this is a good one. (laughs) It's actually the shortest Bible verse in Greek by two letters and one word. Of course, the English one that's the shortest is Jesus wept. A few letters, a few words, but a big ask and a big challenge, nevertheless. It's a small sentence, just two words, but also a big promise to us. And so I do invite you to maybe commit this to memory. It's only two words. And think about it through the Christmas season and even beyond as a challenge and as an encouragement to us as we walk with Christ. Rejoice is an imperative verb. Second person plural. You all, all of you, or all yous, (laughs) rejoice, Paul says. It's what Christ commands us to do in the parables of the lost things, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and then the lost prodigal. What does the one who found that which is lost say when they come back? Rejoice with me, or come into the party with the prodigal to celebrate the one who was once dead but is now alive. It's the one thing that we do now that we will continue to do until the Lord comes back and even into eternity. We will rejoice forever and ever. And so Paul says, rejoice always. Always is an adverb modifying the verb to rejoice. This is a heavenly call to joy. And it is also a form of prayer. Praise and adoration and thanksgiving are all forms of prayer, as we'll remember. The next verse tells us that we are to pray without ceasing. Always. That we are to give thanks in all circumstances. It's another way of saying, always. So prayer is not just asking God for things, going through our list and making requests. Prayer is also inclining our hearts and our minds and filling our mouths with praise to God and gratitude. And this we can always do if prayer is also a posture, an attitude, and a a knowledge that we are in the Lord's hands. Of course, we live in a culture, don't we, that normalizes negativity and gives us a sense of entitlement. And I've talked about this before, but neuroscience speaks of human beings Collectively, we are, not just Americans, but all human beings, we easily get stuck on the negative. That's the way our brains are wired. We have a negativity bias, scientists tell us. And that makes sense if living each day is just a matter of survival or getting what we want. That would fill anyone with anxiety and would rob anybody of joy. And so the tendency that we have is to red flag things in people as we live life. We go through life saying that that person is a threat. That thing is a danger. She is no good. He is up to no good. He's a problem. And it only takes one negative thought, one negative word that we hear to stick to our brains like Velcro. It's why we should thoughtfully 
engage with the news and social media that is filled with toxicity and negativity. It generates anxiety. And when it generates anger, we should not let it stop the flow of joy that God wants us to have in our lives. I remember my dad being welled up with anxiety after watching cable news. And he said, I don't know what to do. And my mom said, turn it off. (laughs) Just turn it off. It's time to do something else. On the other hand, when someone speaks to us a kind word or does something thoughtful or encouraging or says something thoughtful, sadly, that positivity has a tendency to slip through our brains like Teflon, like water off the back of a duck. And they tell us, these scientists and researchers, that in order for positivity to make a positive impact, we must savor those things in our minds for at least 30 seconds. It may not sound like a long time, but the next time somebody stops their car so that you can go before them, does something rare and kind, (laughs) take 30 seconds to just give thanks and be grateful for the kindness of others. Make that a practice so that we would all rejoice always. And so we need to hold fast to every blessing that we acknowledge and that we see and experience. And we should always cherish the goodness of God. He's good all the time. All the time, he is good. We should do so at least long enough for it to take root in our lives, to bear the fruit of joy. And that's exactly what joy is. It is a fruit of the Spirit that that God gives us and wells within our hearts. Like Jesus says, like a well springing up from our hearts, as he spoke to the the, the Samaritan woman. One thing that I've noticed about our confirmation students over the years, not just here at St. Luke, but everywhere, is that if you ask them what God did for you to bring you forgiveness and eternal life, the the answer inevitably is that Christ died for us, which is the correct answer. But even the suffering and death of Jesus can stick to our minds negatively like Velcro. It's just one part of the gospel. Actually, it's not totally complete. It is the core of our faith. But what about the positive, joyous things that Jesus did, such as leaving his heavenly throne to be born of a virgin in the manger in Bethlehem? What about the way he enriched our lives through his healings and his teachings? What about his praying and his interceding for us even now as he is at the right hand of the Father? And certainly, what about his rising again from the dead to conquer evil and death and our sin? That is a positive thing. That is worth 30 seconds of contemplation. And so rejoicing is expressing the joy that God has given us in Christ. And it's rooted in Christ. And so it is always present and available to us because we have a Savior that never leaves or forsakes us, but is always with us. His grace and blessings are all around us, always. So we should be able to rejoice always without ceasing, in every circumstance. When I was a student at Dallas Theological Seminary, my first job there was as a garage attendant. So I took the money as people left at the end of the day from their jobs to pay me. (laughs) And so I had a lot of time to study. It was a great job. I could read and study during that day. But there was a man, an older African-American man, who 
walked to the garage. His job was to clean everybody's messes. He also would uh, detail your car or wash your car while you were at work. And he would always, as he walked around, as he cleaned the car, he was always singing spiritual songs, hymns, and psalms to his God. Early on, I asked him, what gives you such great joy, Samson, that it pours out even into your work here and into your life? His answer was, I walk and I talk with God. That's why I rejoice. In preparing for this sermon, I came across a story written by the poet Naomi Nye about a flight delay that she had in Albuquerque, New Mexico, that had everybody in an uproar. But before I tell you the story, how have you observed people reacting (laughs) to their flights being delayed when you've been in the airport? How do they speak, how do people speak to the flight attendants and to the staff? And how self-absorbed do we all get in the negativity that we're all prone to be? And so Naomi found herself in the same spot at the airport with the flight long delayed. She heard an announcement as she was pacing back and forth through the airport. If anyone understands Arabic, please come to gate A4 to help. Not only, did a, na, not only does Naomi speak Arabic, she also had the same gate, A4, that she was departing from. An older woman in full traditional Palestinian embroidered dress, just like her grandmother wore, Naomi's grandmother wore, this woman was crumpled to the floor wailing loudly in despair. Naomi, speaking her heart language, stooped down to put her arm around the woman and she spoke to her in her not-so-great but adequate Arabic. As soon as the older woman heard her words, the older woman stopped crying immediately. She thought that the flight was canceled altogether and wasn't going out until the next day. She needed to be in El Paso for a major medical procedure that was a life or death situation. Naomi stayed with her all the way to El Paso, sitting next to her on the airline, which makes me believe it was Southwest Airlines, but that's another matter. (laughs) As they waited for their flight, the older woman started handing out handmade, homemade powdered sugar cookies to everyone. To the flight attendants, to the staff, to all the passengers, all the children, all the older people, so that everybody was covered in powdered sugar. Everybody was not only covered with powdered sugar, but the indelible mark of joy. The airline decided to give everyone juice And they were no longer these disgruntled and stressed out strangers now waiting for their long delayed flight. They were now joyful pilgrims sharing the Eucharist of powdered sugar cookies and juice. And so we are invited to the table during Advent to await our Lord's return as joyful pilgrims. And so we pray, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.